Welcome to the What's Your Ceiling podcast. We're your hosts, Monty Wyatt and Paul Szynski. Wherever you are in life, there is a higher ceiling. This podcast is how you become aware of it and how to take action to push through it. It's time to discover your ceiling. Welcome to What's Your Ceiling podcast. My name's Monty Wyatt and with me is Paul Sosinski. Hey, Paul, great to have you here today. We are What's Your Ceiling. We're here to talk about health, family, and business, and how do we break through different ceilings. We have a great guest with us today. Paul, I'm going to have you introduce our guest today. So I'm honored to have this guest here today, a good friend of mine. We grew up together, and uh, he grew up in an Italian family in southern Iowa. Uh, he's achieved a lot of stuff that uh, we talk about as an achiever. He's a, probably about as well-balanced achiever I think I've probably ever been involved with. But I want to introduce to one and only Tony Perenza. Oh, thank you, Paul and Monty. Thank you for having me. Yeah, um, first of all, with that introduction, I, uh, I better not let you down. <laughs> the, um, no, uh, as uh, Paul and Monty, we were talking, and a little bit about my background is I grew up in southern Iowa, down by Melrose, Iowa in an Irish Catholic community. And of course, we were Catholic Italians, and uh, but the Irish let us stay because we sold the coldest beer in town. So we uh, had a very humble business, but a successful business. Uh, my parents uh, migrated from Italy in 1922 and started uh, a little business in um, Southern Iowa. Uh, my uncle Attilio, or, or jo, excuse me, Joseph Emilio opened a, st- a store in Albia, Iowa, and then my grandpa Tilio opened a little store in Melrose, Iowa. Uh, they both came over with the intentions of working in the coal mines, but uh, they soon figured out that it was a lot easier to sell beer to the Irish than to go up and down <laughs> the shafts and the coal mines in southern Iowa. <laughs> yeah, what, what, what a great start. Uh, Tony, and I think today we're talking about, Monty and I are talking about balance. I think, would you, how do you see balance, Monty? I mean, in business, family, health? You know, balance is an interesting topic because you, you hear people talk about, I want balance in life, I want balance from work and, and home life. It, it's, there, you go through seasons. Mm-hmm. I think you go through seasons of when you have different types of balance. Uh, but it's choosing what you want to have important in your life is how mm-hmm. I see it. Balance is identifying your priorities and giving time to those different areas. So I, I think as, as we all think about balance and we want our achiever to yeah. think about balance, it, it's to me it's identifying your priorities and making time for them. How I would agree. you define it? I agree, Monty, and I, and I think it's a struggle for some, some of us to find that balance, and I, I think it takes – uh, when you're younger, you're always hard, hard charging. I think it takes years of maturity, and I think uh, to find that balance, I, I'm still trying to find it, find that balance, and I'm still working on it. But uh, uh, we're fortunate to have a guy here. I think he's worked, has found his balance, and uh, I'm really excited to, to listen to his story and his achievements. And uh, I think Monty and I are blessed to have you how would how would you define balance tony and and what's what's that mean to you well you know first of all i I think that uh balance comes with maturity and not that our young folks don't have balance but i know i've gotten better with balance over the years primarily because of the mistakes that i've made in life Mm. you know you learn i I've learned a lot more from failures than I have successes. And um, I think balance has come a lot with me with maturity. Yeah, and, and there's no doubt if you don't have balance, you know, you, there's a lot of ways to have addictions. You can have an addiction of, of, of uh, work. You can have an addiction of, of, of even health. You know, you can diet too much. You can, you know, there's a lot of ways to, to have addictions and balance will levels those addictions off. But um, I'm a big believer, faith, family, and career. Uh, if you don't have faith, that's the foundation of, of uh, I think, most successful people. Um, you know, I'm a big believer that if you pray together, you stay together. 
and not trying to sound like Billy Graham today on your talk show, but uh, I just think that uh, balance is, is the key. Now, now, you grew up in a family, nine kids? Yeah, nine children. Nine children, a th- uh, three-bedroom house in the back, yep. grocery store, tavern in the front. Yep. And, you know, what, what a, I, you probably got your education right there in that, right there in that uh, building. Paul, you know, it's funny. I always tell people, you know, I went to college and, of course, high school, and, and, uh, and education is so important. But the education that we received growing up in a non-traditional home, yeah. think about this, nine kids three bathrooms, three bedrooms, and having a business connected to it. So you were always in the public eye. And the business was a a grocery store slash convenience store slash bar. So you might be waiting on a customer in your pajamas. (laughs) Um, And we were open 365 days a year. And if, if we were closed in the middle of the night and somebody needed something, they knocked on the back door. And we opened up. How old were you when you served your first customer? Well, you know what? I remember I had to stand on a stool to reach the crank on the cash <laughs> register. And that was back when you had to serve. Right. You went out and pumped the gas. Yeah, you went out and pumped your gas. But then we always joked that we kind of invented self-service because we were all <laughs> anti-wiping windshields <laughs> and checking oil. So we kind of felt like we invented self-service. But I, can't, I think one of the biggest things as a, as a kid that we learned is is people skills Mm -hmm. you know i can remember my dad uh, after church on sunday we'd have clients or customers from church from our little saint patrick's catholic church in melrose they would come out the ladies would come out and they'd buy their cheese and their salami and we'd be cutting it up and i can never forget my dad cutting a real thin piece of salami and handling it to handing it to mary joe or margie or virginia or whoever it might be and saying how great his salami was well, his salami was no different than anybody else's. <laughs> it absolutely was the same salami that the next 10 places sold. But he'd give you that little sample, and they'd smile, and they thought that there was only one place to buy salami, and that was a Parenza's Corner. But the, the people skills that were so incredible, he, another quick story is that he would, uh, if we had one customer come in to drink a beer, and they were by themselves. We could not leave that customer alone until another customer came in that would talk to him because you didn't want him, want him to leave. Right. And I can never forget, you, there might be a complete stranger, and my dad would say, sta la qua, sta la qua, which is stay here in Italian, stay with him. So growing up as kids at 9 and 10 years old, I might have to sit and visit with a truck driver that's from Grand Island, Nebraska. <laughs> that I had no clue what his interests were, but you learned to communicate and you learned to develop people skills. And I think that's a big part of where we're failing today is with all the social media and the Zoom. Mm-hmm. And that's one reason why I retired when the COVID hit and we quit shaking hands and we quit getting out in front of the customer, it made it more difficult for me to, to Relationships are everything. Oh, I, I still tell you they are. I yeah. agree, Mark. And, and you know, raising nine kids out of a grocery store, tavern, it, it must have been amazing because I know in 1974 you had an issue with uh, the the alcohol law yeah and that was an interesting you couldn't sell alcohol on yeah on Can, Sundays. couldn't sell alcohol on sunday matter of fact uh, my dad used to always joke uh, and we had quite a little business uh, it was a humble business but we were we were um, very blessed with lake rathman which was down in our neck of the woods so we were really really busy and it was illegal to sell beer on sunday uh, back in those days but of course we bootlegged on Sundays and we got our price. Now I hope I'm not gonna get, get in trouble or put in jail, but it was forty years ago, so I'm probably <laughs> safe by now with the statute of limitations. But uh but we uh we when they legalized beer sales, my dad was the most disappointed guy there was because lost margin. <laughs> he lost margin and market share. They could get it anywhere. 
But there were so many little lessons like that, Monty, and, and but I I think uh, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't have changed a thing growing up as a kid. You know, we look back at it and we talk about it with our brothers and sisters and who we were a real close family and we were a really good team. We all we all knew we had to get home after our dates early enough to fill the bags of ice and to fill the beer coolers and get ready for the next day. We all had our kind of little chores and assignments and it was um, non-traditional, very humble because there was no privacy. There, I mean, we literally connected our store, but it was, um, it was a wonderful education that helped develop skills, lifelong skills for all of all nine kids. Hmm. It really, really did. And you also had, didn't you have one of the number one grocery store gentlemen come down and meet with your dad and talk about yeah, the, uh, what a great idea? It was actually, that's a great story, Paul. Uh, the, Mr. Lamberti, the founder of Casey's, uh, came down and visited with my dad and mom, and I don't know what year ago it was, years years ago, about building these type of stores around the country and we were kind of picked my dad's brain and we we kind of joked that we had two stores we had a franchise of two stores because my uncle Joe and Albia had a store and we had the little humble store in Melrose but uh, Casey's actually developed a lot of their ideas from our store and I can remember uh, my mom telling me that when dad was visiting with them he must have had either a little too much bourbon in him or wine. And he, uh, towards the end of the meeting, he told him the more he thought about it, he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't mess with it. Well, of course, now there's three or 4,000 Casey stores, so thank God <laughs> yeah. they didn't listen to Dad. <laughs> uh, but it was, a great, uh, it's, it was a great business. We were open for 59 years, um, raised two families. Um, and, um, like I said, you know, it was a choice that they, that part of the country was you were going to coal mine or figure some farm or figure something else out. And they got tired of the coal mines. Yeah. You were de definitely the Perenses were leaders in Melrose, Iowa, a little Irish community in Southern Iowa. I mean, the, you guys, I think were the, uh, some of the, uh, your, your sisters, you're part of the church, part of the community. I think it was a big, uh, part of why the success of, of, uh, Melrose today. Well, and I think Melrose Melrose was awful good to us. The the uh, the people of Melrose. You know, we always had the highest prices, and uh, but people supported us. You know, we they knew that we had a big family, and uh, and they knew we were going to be there for them, and they were there for us. You know, they could go and east or west and find cheaper beer cheaper gas cheaper <laughs> salami but they supported us they did and you know you got your education mm -hmm. you, you graduate high school you were uh, you were in sports you played football you played yeah. uh basketball you're the point guard of the number two state rated yeah team we had a really we had a really good, good basketball basketball was, was kind of my sport i really enjoyed it i had a great group of guys that we played that you know we played year round and um it was fun. It was really fun. And then after, uh, after high school, I went got my associate degree at Des Moines Community College. Uh, and then I went to school at Iowa State as a non-traditional student because I got married young. And uh, I was actually married for 20 years and got a divorce, which was without a doubt was the toughest, really hard on me because I felt like I let my family down and my kids down. And but. I got remarried to a beautiful person and uh, two additional children now. So we have five children and my wife, Kathy and I have 12 awesome grandkids, a little wild, <laughs> you know, I'm one of those grandparents that like to see the taillights <laughs> and, uh, but they're, uh, we're real blessed right now. And, but I know that whenever I've had my challenges in life, I've reached to my faith. And not only my faith, but my friends. And, you know, people like Paul Sadzinski. And, you know, I'm a big believer that you are who you're with. And if you want to be successful and stay motivated, you surround yourself with people that are going to put you in position to win. 
T tell us about that. Our audience is the achiever, and we want to help people break through ceilings. Tell us how you've interacted with your friends, how you've used your your faith to get through challenges. Because I, I think that's that's something that we all need today. It's, and tell us specifically how you did that. Well, you know, it's I know, I know during the course of my career, my life, when I was working, I was with Owens Corning for 25 years as a regional sales manager. And then I was with Indiana Limestone for 15 years. So first of all, I was real blessed to work for two tremendous companies. Owens Corning was five, six billion dollar uh, company in the construction industry, well known, brand recognition with the Pink Panther. And Indiana Limestone is our nation's building stone. It's on 36 of our nation's capitals. I mean, it's countless projects. We did projects. We did Derek Jeter's house. We did uh, the Pentagon. I mean, it's just, so I worked for two companies where when I walked into somewhere, I had a dip, uh, right away I had credibility. But what I tried to do to get back to your question, Monty, is I necessarily didn't utilize my sales leadership when I was with these companies, but I'd, I'd utilize my peers. Mm -hmm. I try to find the Paul Szynski kind of guy in each organization, somebody you can trust, somebody that you, that you knew was going to give you good solid information, good, not sugarcoat it, but at the same time bring you up and not bring you down. Because mm -hmm. there's enough people out there that's going to bring you down. Absolutely. But you gotta, you gotta, you gotta find um, mentors, and you have to find folks that are gonna, that have your best interest. And there's not a lot. Of, a lot of times, there's that's tough. Mm -hmm. And then you you divide that in. And I'm I've always been a big believer in in my faith. You know, my spiritual leaders. I might have a friend that that's that will that helps me more with my faith than necessarily he would about an architectural strategy for Indiana Limestone. Hmm. So you have, you kind of have to have different arenas of peers that you go to, that you can trust. Yep. And that's what I've always tried to do is I've always, I've always told people I'm an average guy, but I'm pretty good about surrounding myself with people that'll help you win. I love that. You know, I, I want to put a challenge out to our audience, the achiever, uh, to think about who do you have as a friend? And, and a mentor to connect like that because we we all need that that person no matter what we're going through whether right. it's a divorce whether it's uh, family issues whether it's health whether it's faith you need you need that kind of friendship yeah you do and in, and it's and it's not necessarily going to be the same person you almost need to categorize your right you know I I have I have a son that. Uh, I go to a lot from some of my business ideas because he's a real sharp numbers guy. He's a no nonsense guy. And so, you know, you, you, you gotta have, there's, it can be different individuals. It doesn't have to necessarily be the same person for all your different challenges. Yeah, and you know, and another thing, when you went, you hired for Owens Corning and at Indiana Limestone, what type of qualities of uh, people did you hire and what you, who did you see that were the achievers and the people that uh, may not reach that, reach that uh, ceiling? You know, Paul, one of my favorite assignments with Owens Corning was uh, I got involved with the human real HR department and I did a lot of recruiting. Most of my recruiting was at the University of Purdue. And um, when I when I would meet these young people, first of all, the first thing I look for is passion. It's somebody that's excited. And the other thing is, is somebody that's hungry. You know, I always, I always could tell uh, a young person if they were gonna be successful, almost by the way they walked into the room, and if they were hungry. And if, and, and it's and you know it's hard to teach that. You kind of have to grow. It's got to kind of be in your DNA. But you know, I always wanted somebody to sit down in front of me, and I always told them, you know, I want I want an SAR. And they'd say, What's an SAR? I want to I know about a situation, your action, and your result. 
I don't want to come in and and hear about your your handicap on the golf course. Typically, if they had a low handicap, I might be a little nervous <laughs> because they're playing too much time on the golf course. Um, so I really, really, really love passion and enthusiasm. I remember the last kid I hired with the uh, Indiana Limestone. He was in the interview, and he was real. Ex- he did everything right. Uh, full of excitement, full of passion. He's one of those gut kids you could tell that would dive on a bayonet. And when he um, finished with the interview, he looked over at me and said, Mr. Perenza, when do I start? I said, you know, that kid, I like him. <laughs> he asked for the order. And that's, that was always big for me too, you know. And he, he, didn't, he wasn't there wanting to know the first question out of the gate, what's the salary range? He wanted to know about me. He wanted to know about the company. Um, but I think passion, somebody that's easily motivated, you know, I, I like a, I like a young person that I can sit down with and in five minutes when they go out the door, they don't open it. They go through it. Mm -hmm. They're so excited. And Mm -hmm. that's what, that's what you got. I like to have that type of an employee that likes to win. Well, that's what, what a great way to, an example of a great achiever. And I mean, that's what we're about mm-hmm. and about finding that guy that wants to join our team as an achiever, whether it be an employee, a friend, I think it all counts. And, and you've been very successful and you've worked with a variety of different people, business people all over the United States. And I know mm-hmm. you've worked with Dick Vitale on a motivation yeah. before. Yep. Yeah. I worked with Dick when I was with Owens Corning and just a real quick story on Dick. We, uh, I'll never forget. We hired him. And it was $10,000 for him to come speak at my sales this meeting. This is 25 years ago. 25 years ago. $10,000 to come speak for an hour. And when I, I didn't know Dick, but just my perception of him watching him on TV was he was kind of a bag of wind. <laughs> but he came, Monty and Paul, and spoke to our group, and he was in a sweatpants. And he ended up speaking for two hours. And I'd never been in a crowd where he had 800 salespeople one minute laughing so hard they were crying. And then the next minute, when he would talk about Jim Valvano, his close friend that died of cancer, he'd have a crowd, 800 people crying, listening to that story. But the best story, the best thing about Vital is, you know, the guy went on and coached in the NBA, and he coached, I believe, at the University of Detroit. And prior to that, he couldn't even make his sixth grade basketball team. Mm-hmm. He'd joke about he was a blind, one-eyed Italian, <laughs> which he was. He could only see out of one eye. And Dick went on to have an incredible career, not only as a coaching, not only as in coaching, but as a broadcaster, and he's a really good example how passion and energy and attitude can trump a lot of the other mm-hmm. arenas. And uh, but Dick uh, was a um, one of my favorite people that I, that I've ever met. I had a chance to have dinner with him that night, and. I told him I was from Iowa, and right away he wanted to talk about Chris Street, Dr. Tom Davis. I mean, he he know he knew his business. And he came on there with the sweats, and he went and for come about in, one and hour he was completely two. drenched when he was done with his presentation, because he was that involved in it. Hmm. And it was um, it was a real one of the highlights of uh, my career to get to spend a couple of days with Dick. That's awesome. That's what you call passion. Yeah. Now, I, I want to come back to our, our topic of balance today. Okay. And, and I'd love to hear you tell a story. You mentioned earlier that balance comes with maturity. How, how have you grown in your balance and what have you changed in your balance over the years? Well, I think that my biggest change, 
as I mentioned a little bit earlier, is uh, I, I've never been accused to be accused of being the most creative guy, but I'm, I'm pretty good at copying. And I had a sales leader once by the name of Tom, Tom Quigley. And he was the best listener that I've ever worked with in my entire life. He had a way of capturing everything that you would say. Hmm. And I know when you think of balance, the first thing that I kind of think about and when I think of balance is his weaknesses. To get really good balance, you need to identify your weaknesses. And one of my biggest weaknesses over the careers is shutting my mouth. <laughs> you know, I had, a, I had a sales coach tell me one time, he says, Tony, you can sell with anybody. But he says, one of the things you got to remember is once you close the deal, you got to shut the hell up. The talking's <laughs> over, or you'll talk yourself out of it. And when, next thing you know, everything's falling apart. So I think uh, the key to balance to me over the years is to identify my weaknesses. And listening has always been one of them. Uh, and I, the other thing that in balance is silence has always bothered me. If I'm even with my wife going down the car for so many miles, I might want, I might start talking to her about a combine going down the road that she has no interest in, but I just want to talk. <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, so I think silence. I've had to learn with good balance and good friends. There's nothing wrong with silence when you're with somebody, mm -hmm. and I think along with silence, there's also. Uh, a chance when somebody's struggling to, to to not only listen, but I always try to get them to repeat it. Hmm. So that way they know you're really sincere. And the other thing that does when you get somebody to repeat something, it kind of wears them out. That their problem <laughs> isn't as critical as maybe they realized. But um, so I think that's a big part of what I've tried to do with balance is, and I've had enough challenges in my life that I know the two biggest things that I reach out to when I have a real bad challenge in my life is, of course, my faith, and the other is my health. You would not know it, but I go to the health club about every day, and I do it not for physical exercise as much as it helps clear my head. Mm -hmm. So it's another part of my balance. What, what do you do for exercise at the gym? I do 20 minutes on the elliptical, and... Um, I just noticed there's an 80-year-old woman that's beside me that goes every morning, and she does 40, and she does six incline, and I do a three. So I've got <laughs> some improvements to do. And uh, but she, but I do 20 minutes on elliptical, and then I, when I'm done on my elliptical, I usually pick out three to four different weights to to work. So my my uh, routine is about 30, 40 minutes long. Um, but I like to get another thing is I, I don't I'm not a guy to work out at home because I like to walk into a health club and say hey Bill how's it going and hey Rhonda how are you doing I, I it, it motivates me to be around people and if I go down in the basement and try to watch the news by myself it just doesn't cut it it helps me to get somewhere where there's yeah. people and, and you're you're working now as a consultant, I believe. Yes, yeah, so I'm doing a little bit of consulting, and I'm gonna. I'd like to do some, some more of that. I've been retired for a year, and we're traveling. We spend six weeks in Florida, Kathy and I do, and we. Um, so we're and I'm like with twelve grandkids. I can go to a soccer, or baseball game anytime I want, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I enjoy that. But I'm I I need something a little more challenging, so I've been trying to. Uh, network with some old existing customers hmm. on some growth opportunities for them and so I have a couple of guys I've been working with and uh, I've really enjoyed it because I'm getting good feedback and uh, that's at my age that's just as important as the money really I mean, yeah. don't get me wrong you know I'm not we need the bone. interaction. We need the interaction. 
if I, I just can't get up in the morning and start watching Andy Griffin for eight hours. <laughs> so um, No, Tony, you got a lot of game left. And I think I think anybody out there that would see someone like Tony and what a great – I consult with him all the time. He helps me out, um, and I appreciate all that you do. But, you know, um, in all the th- – over your travels and, 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 you know, one thing I've taken out of this is the passion, the hunger, uh, the motivation, you know, you know, you know, we see those people, you know, when they come into our office, they pick up the atmosphere, you know what I mean? They give that, that you gravitate to that. And I'm glad you brought that up, Tony, because, you know, I look at achievers. I mean, those are signs of an achiever is that passion and that kill in them and the hunger. Mm-hmm. Give, give, me, give us a definition of what you see as an achiever. Well, you know, a, a real simple definition would be uh, an achiever, someone that established consistent goals that he can potentially achieve. But I, but I think an achiever can be there's there's so many different levels of achievers. Mm-hmm. You know, when I, when I when I to this day I still do a things to do list every night before I go to bed. Now it's a little weird now because my things to do this as well do I bag the grass tomorrow or not <laughs> you know the, there's not a high a level of of, a, of a things to do but I think an achiever is, a, is someone that establishes consistent goals that's consistent with what he wants to achieve and uh, hopefully achieves them mm-hmm. you know but I always, I always told myself every day, you know, I told my salespeople all this. When you go make a sales call, and if you don't land an order, that doesn't necessarily mean you, had a, you didn't have a successful sales call. If you came out of there with some competitive information, or if you came out of there and found out that there, there was credit issues, or if you came out of there and found out that the competition's having a price increase, those are all wins and that are successful information to help your company grow. So I, my biggest thing is when, when I was a coach, which I was most of my 40 year career is, is to, to try to teach young people that there's a lot of ways you can win without necessarily scoring a touchdown. Mm-hmm. You know, you could set, you know, put yourself being a in a team position, player. Being a team player. And, and there's some real valuable information and, and um, you know, getting ways back to win. On, on coaching, you know, something we didn't touch on and, and is, is a lot of people don't know that uh, Tony was one of the top uh, baseball coaches in the state of Iowa. He took a team of 13, 14 year olds that, um, to this one the state of Iowa went on to Florida and uh, played down in Florida in the Nationals yeah. and it's a great story and I, I know we don't have enough time to go into it today but um, some of the things that Tony Prince has achieved not only in his business but with his kids and and his kids went on to be his next generation very successful um, and a lot of that attributes to you your dad your uh, the way you were brought up um, but uh, what, what year was it that you won that state title well, in the baseball? Because we was a, it was a, it's a real real quickly. It's a, first of all, Paul's. I don't know if I was the best coach in the state of Iowa or anywhere near it. There was a wonderful coach, <laughs> but I did. I was blessed. I did coach for about twenty years. My kids and even some other kids outside, and, and that was my passion. I loved baseball, and I loved. Uh, uh, my goal always was Monty is that if I had twelve kids on the team. At the end of that year, I wanted those 12 kids to be able to come up to me and say, Coach, I had a good time, and I want to play ball next year. Mm-hmm. That, that's really what my goal was. I wanted everybody to have a good time. And, and if winning worked in the equation, that was great. But I had one year that Paul's talking about. Uh, my son was 14 years old. We had a really good team. And all of a sudden, our three best players defected kind of like the portal that's going on now. <laughs> My three best players went to play on a select team. Well, my team wasn't a select team. They were all just a pretty much a bunch of neighbor kids, Johnston neighbor kids. Well, we 
worked hard. We said we weren't going to let that be a distraction. We were going to have fun and do the best we could do. Well, Monty, we ended up playing in the championship in the state of Iowa, worked our way through our bracket, and we played the team that our players defected for the state championship. So, I mean, it was a, it was a movie environment because <laughs> yeah. the parents were like, well, they all left us. And they're all, we were playing them, David versus Goliath. It was like Rudy and Notre Dame. Well, we beat them four to three to win the state championship. <laughs> what a great story. There's a book in that. What do you think, Mike? Absolutely. Think and we went there. to Florida and had a great time. And <clears throat> um, it was a, we just had a great time. I had a wonderful assistant coach. Uh, Todd Kate was his name. And Jerry Gamble, Tom Abel. They're just I'm, the friends I met and the parents are lifelong friends. How, do you, how did you teach them the right mindset? Because that's, you know, David Goliath, you've, you've mm-hmm. got challenges. How did you help them with mindset? Because it was about fun. You wanted kids to have fun. Right. You wanted to come back and play. But that, that mindset, how did you ingrain that? Well, you know, guys, this, is, this could be a whole other discussion. But one of the things I've always tried to teach, not only in my career, but in sports, is, is to play loose. Hmm. If you've got a big presentation to, to, to present, to a bunch of architects. Something I used to always do when I would present to a group of architects is I would right away lighten up the room with something trivial, like, okay, let's say I was in Indiana, you know, I got a Starbucks gift card if you can tell me what year Indiana became a state, became a <laughs> state. But you gotta lighten stuff up. And if you got a kid at the free throw line in overtime and he's shooting two to win it, do you want his knees to be banging or do you want him to be relaxed? Yeah. And so what I tried to coach with that group of kids and even my coworkers is, is to, you know, you got to have fun. Because you're, first of all, when, when no one's getting paid in baseball. So if you're not having fun, we better be going to the movies or something right. else. So playing <laughs> loose in life is one of my mottos is you got to play loose in life. You got to have fun. You can't take yourself serious. And when you're in this group of kids, they had fun. They had smiles on their faces all the time. And they had a coach that was a pretty goofy guy, which was me. I mean, I had them stealing and I had them swinging on a three and <laughs> count. They were swinging. I had them doing things that were not textbook and they got a kick out of it. And, uh, I think that was the best part. They played loose. And it didn't hurt. I had a kid by the name of Zach Moses that could throw about an 85-mile-an-hour <laughs> fastball at 14 years old. So it doesn't hurt to have, have a little talent. Either. That helps. But it was a great experience for me. And uh, one of the parents actually wrote a little book on it. Uh, I'll have to show it to you, Paul. Yeah. It was a lot of – it was really cool. Um, but just one of those fun family memberships. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. You know, you, you've got a lot of grandchildren. You've got a lot of kids. Mm-hmm. Tell us, what do you want to be known for? When, when, you know, next phase of life comes, what do you want to be remembered by? You know, I, I've thought about that before, and I'd like to think that when, when my name gets brought up by my kids that, or by my friends, that they look back at me as somebody that tried to make them better try to i and i tried to bring people together uh and hopefully maybe even i made them smile once or twice <laughs> you know i would probably say that would be it that's awesome you know yeah. that's great tony well, you know you. we appreciate you coming out here and doing this podcast and uh and uh Great job today. Thank I you very much, Paul. You know, Paul, I, I think we've I've learned a lot from Tony. What, what were some key takeaways that you had from, from our, our conversation today? You know, a key takeaway, and I think in business, and I think we're all guilty of it, is taking things a little too serious. And I think you got to lighten up. And you got to get up there and be loose yeah. and, and have fun. Because why are you going to do it? If you can't have fun, why do it? Why do I mean, that's, you got to keep telling yourself. Absolutely. And I think we all get a little too serious at times. And I'm probably as guilty as anybody, probably more guilty than most. So 
to hear that and hear that come from someone like you, Tony, and has achieved what you've achieved, I think uh, that's a big, big takeaway I've taken today is stay loose. Don't take yourself too serious. Have fun. I love it. A couple, couple other takeaways that I had is, uh, you know, passion, hungry, and like to win. You, know, you really want to accomplish things in life. You've got to have passion around it. You've got to have mm -hmm. energy, and you got to want to win. Mm -hmm. and, and if you don't have that hunger, it's going to be a challenging life for you. Yeah, it so, really is. So you got to have that hunger. So I, I love that takeaway, and I, I love your definition of, of balance is balance comes with maturity, but you need to find people in every area that you want to have balance in uh, to help bring you back to mm -hmm. center. And uh, so I really appreciate your learnings, your conversation, and Thank it's you, been Mark. fun getting to know you. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, buddy. I want to want to challenge our achiever out there to continue to look at your balance and who can you bring into your life to help you bring balance. So thanks for joining us today. Look forward to seeing you on the next episode.